This is the Thrive Podcast with Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. And now, Pastor Fred Jeff Smith. Hello, welcome to the Thrive Podcast with the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. I'm Fred Jeff Smith, pastor of Shiloh, and I'm very happy that you chose to either view this on YouTube or listen to it on iTunes or Spotify. Uh, As always, we invite your comments. with regard to the podcast, let us know how we're doing. Uh, we're closing in on the end of the second year of the Thrive Podcast, and we want to hear from you uh, as to how you value this uh, opportunity to engage in conversation and discussion. You can reach me at Fred Jeff Smith at Cox.net. Fred Jeff Smith at Cox.net. Just drop us a note. Let us know what you think about the Thrive Podcast. I'm very happy to welcome back for the second time uh, Mr. Saylor Jackson uh, to the Thrive Podcast. Mr. Jackson uh, is a community activist and he is an expert in elections. And this is an interesting time of year uh, for us to talk about elections. Mr. Jackson, welcome back. Uh, Well, thank you for having me back. Not quite an expert, but I've been paying pretty close attention to the process for a little while. Well, but you also worked in this process for, <laughs> yes, for a very long period yes, of did. time. So yes. let's jump right in and talk about Kyle Art. Uh, let, let, let's talk about the the current Secretary of State running for uh, uh, his seat currently. Uh, the election is going to be uh, held on Saturday. And uh, last week, uh, a week ago Tuesday, uh, Mr. Ardwin uh, was in Monroe. Louisiana, and he engaged in activity on video, uh, endorsing uh, the candidacy of uh, Eddie Responi for governor and endorsing Donald Trump for president of the United States. Louisiana will continue to win. We will win with Donald Trump. And by state statute, by state law, uh, the Secretary of State can only campaign for himself, cannot campaign for any other individual under any circumstances. So why is it, number one, that Mr. Ardwin seemingly did not know this? And number two, why is it that we're having such a hard time getting media to at least address this and and bring this up to the attention of the public as we prepare to go and vote uh, on Saturday? Well, uh, number one, uh, you're right. Uh, The fact that it is in black and white, it is bold, it is that, and it says that being the chief election officer of the state, you cannot get involved in any outside election activities and endorsing people other than yourself. You can only do what is best for you. Right. But I don't know why. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't even answer that question. Uh, that's one of the things that um, when I was there that I was told by by the Secretary of State at that time, who was Tom Shadler, that you could not do that and stay away from it, and which we did. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as why the media has not picked up on it, I'm kind of at a loss for words for that, Pastor. I, I, I don't understand that. It's a story. It's something that should be talked about. It should be addressed, uh, and those questions that you just asked me should be addressed to um, Mr. Ardwin. Well, I've asked it uh, on my Facebook page. I know it has limited reach to mm-hmm. people, but I've asked the, the, the question every day for the last several days. Uh, Rolf McAllister at Bad News Business Report can pick up on every little nook and cranny of information uh, that he feels is useful in denigrating the public school system and denigrating the mayor's office and denigrating the Democratic Party. But when it comes to a clear violation on videotape, Baton Rouge Business Report has been mute. Nothing from Stephanie Regal, nothing from J.R. Ball, nothing from Rolf McAllister. Uh, and I'm not just talking about their two-week mm-hmm. periodical that they put mm-hmm. out. They put out a daily uh, email of, of, of the news of the day, and I have scoured it every day, and nothing has come 
of it. The advocate has said absolutely nothing about it. Uh, WBRZ television here in town has said absolutely nothing about it. And when questioned about it, uh, they they said that uh, the information came from a liberal uh, uh, media source, which somehow made it invalid. Well, if it's on videotape, it doesn't matter whether it's liberal or conservative or moderate. It doesn't matter whether it comes from Jupiter or Mars. You have it on videotape where he is endorsing candidates at a rally uh, held, sponsored by the President of the United States for Eddie Responi. And, and, and so this to me is not a question of uh, of partisanship. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a question of those who are in power and how they choose to use the power that's at their disposal. Well, when you, That's my opinion. I'm well, sorry. I understand. <laughs> and and, and I, I've often had, I've had this conversation with a few other people about this. And the question is, why? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? You know this. And, and I know it's, it's right outside right before the election, but a clear violation of the law that we choose not to report on or not to address, that is the valid question. Why? Why shouldn't the citizens know that this was done? The election officer is the gatekeeper to our elections. Like you said before, he's the umpire. If he or she is not doing or has done something in violation of that law, they need to be held accountable for it. And the people be, need to know exactly what they did so that we don't have to wonder about the election, the outcome of the election, if there's a possibility that uh, there could be a discrepancy. Once you have the office and it's tainted, then the election process could become the same way or you feel like it could become the same way. And that is what you do not want. You do not want to even think that there's any uh, improprieties or anything going on with any of the elections that we have here in the state of Louisiana. And I find it interesting because it's been primarily Republicans that have uh, uh, made these pushes to shift around uh, the way elections are carried out in various states across the country, uh, citing the fact that they want to maintain the integrity of the electoral process and, and everything that they have done uh, has been an effort to nullify and limit uh, uh, liberal, progressive, African-American, brown folk from voting. They've changed uh, polling places. They've, they've changed times of polling. Uh, th this election uh, that's being held on Saturday is being held at a time when several thousand African-American people are going to be out of the city and out of the state uh, attending a sport event. Interesting that the election was not held last Saturday while LSU was playing Alabama, but it is being held this coming Saturday uh, uh, while Southern is playing Jackson State in Jackson, Mississippi. But they, 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 they make this claim that we want to make the election process as fair and as upfront as possible. And yet when the person who is responsible for monitoring and maintaining uh, fairness in the election process tilts his hand in the favor of one party and one candidate over another, no one seems to, to have anything to say about it. In fact, we're told that it's a non-story, that it's a non-issue, and that those that pursue it uh, are, are pursuing non-stories. I, I know you're asking why. We know why. And, and, and my concern is, what can be done about it? Well, you know, you can't, I mean, you can't sit on the sideline anymore. There, there's too much at, at stake for us as individuals, as a state, as a nation, as a country. You cannot sit on the sideline and not participate. If you see something wrong and you know it's wrong, then it's incumbent upon you 
as that person to say something, to address it. And don't sit back. And we all need to do it. And the people that we voted for to put in that are in those positions, we should expect them to speak up for us as well because we voted for them so that they would be able maybe get more traction on what, what we're trying to do than what we would be able to do. I, I just think that's that's the I think that's the solution. That's what you gotta do. If you don't do that then then you have no, you, you have no, you, if you don't vote and you don't go to your people and say something about something that's wrong, then you don't have any reason to complain because you have been complacent and you just let it happen without saying anything. How do you respond as, as someone who has experience with the voting process and, and who has a lifetime of service in this community and in this state with regard to civil rights and social activism? How do you respond to those people who say, my life doesn't change when I vote? I voted, and, and, and nothing about my life has changed by virtue. I voted for Edwin Edwards, nothing in my life changed. I voted for Kathleen Blanco, nothing in my life changed. I voted for John Bell Edwards, nothing in my life changed. Uh, I, I, I still hold a minimum wage job. I still have this problem, that problem, and the other problem. You keep telling me to go vote, and, and I don't see where my life changes because I vote. What What is your response to that kind of pushback? Well, my pushback on that is if you had not voted, it could be a lot worse. If you had not voted, let's say, for instance, you had not voted for Edwin Edwards at a particular time when he was running against another person, uh, David Duke. Yes. You think your life would, I, I can assure you, your life would have been a lot different then. Yes. And I just use that as an extreme. But you just have to look at all the other things that have taken place as a result of you voting for the people that you voted for who are in those offices. You say that your, your lifestyle didn't change. Maybe you don't realize it, but it did change, and it changed for the better. It kept you from being in a worse situation than you probably would have been in. And the other thing is, let's look back. Let's go way back. Mm -hmm. You know, if voting was not such a big deal, why did we have our forefathers who were trying to vote, and when they vote, they were killed, they were hanged, they were burned, they were torn apart. Uh, it, you think that it didn't matter to them? And so you're going to sit back and not participate in a process that people have bled and died for? Your ancestors? No, don't tell me that. I don't want to hear that. You, you can't. You, no. No. If your life is not better, that's because any other number, any other things, but it's not because you voted. I can assure you that. In the uh, general election last month, uh, it's been reported that 73 percent of African Americans across this state did not vote. 73 percent of eligible African American voters did not exercise their right uh, to vote. Uh, we're hoping that that number will be different uh, at the end of the primary uh, this weekend. Uh, but still, with early voting having come and gone, uh, only 30 percent of African Americans uh, statewide participated in early voting, which means that there's still a large number of African Americans who have not made their way to the polls. Uh, what is it? And, 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 and I know that that outreach has been done uh, into churches, into civic organizations, into fraternal organizations, uh, Greek organizations. Uh, candidates have reached out in every possible way. The NAACP uh, has put forth efforts to try to get uh, stronger, mm -hmm. higher voter turnout. So. My question is, uh, what more can we do uh, as as 
citizens and, and, and as groups within our communities, what more can we do to help uh, generate a stronger voter turnout? You just can't do it every now and then. When you're talking about voter education and getting people involved in the process, especially the voting process, you just can't do it right around a certain time of the year or for this or that. You have to do it and you have to get kids started at an early age so that they can see that them being involved in a voting process makes a difference. Uh, it's an example that was given to me a long time ago. You have, you got Let's say, for instance, you got 10 kids and they're sitting in a classroom. You got 10. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, you got five on this side and you got five on this side. This five on this side votes to have recess. This five on this side doesn't vote at all. Guess what? You're going to have you recess. Have recess. <laughs> but guess what? What if it had been the other way around? What if they had vote, been voting not to have recess? And these five says, I'm a scholar. I don't need to go out and play. I don't want to play. So they voted against recess. Guess what? Now there's no recess. If you teach them that early on those simpler terms mm -hmm. so that they can really get it and mm -hmm. understand it, I think that that's what will resonate in their mind. But you have to do it. You have to be continuous with it. You have to do it at the schools. And you have to do it at the church you're talking about voting. You have to do it in your civic organizations. And, and even in little league baseball and football, you know, they have vote. You vote on stuff there, too. Right. What color uniform was this and that. But you have to let them know that casting your ballot or voicing your opinion about a situation or a particular subject is very important. And you have to drive that home to them. If you don't drive that home to them, I just don't think they'll ever get it. I really don't. Earlier this year, uh, uh, first part of the year, uh, law went into effect that said that those uh, who had been convicted of felonies uh, now, many of them are now eligible to vote. They have to register, but they're eligible to vote. And some people thought that with that new eligibility that we would see an increase in voting. Uh, the early reports that I have heard is that it, it has not had the impact that people thought that it would uh, because some people fear that by exercising their right to vote, by registering to vote, that somehow or other the closer scrutiny would be brought upon them by law enforcement. Uh, now, I know that myths are myths and, and you, mm -hmm. can't, you, you can't fight every rumor. But what, what I hear you saying is that we have to do a job, a better job of voter education. Absolutely. And it has to be year-round, not just at voting time. It has to be. Voter education, I believe it, and I've always said it, it's the key. You have to educate your young people and especially the 18 to 25 or the 18 to 30, they seem not to care. They just seem not to be involved or in the process as much as they should be. Mm -hmm. So you need to figure out some kind of way to get them in there, to, 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 to appeal to them, to let them know that you have to be a part of this process. It's very important that you be not not just black or white. I'm just saying all basically all 18 to 35. They just don't. Mm -hmm. They don't participate. Mm -hmm. So figuring that out, and I guess if I could have figured that out, I'd be along doing something else. But if you could figure that out, how you could get them involved and keep them continually involved, that's the key. That's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that because once they get there and they see that what they're doing, particularly in this age range, is making a difference, I think it'll carry over. And I think they'll want to do the same thing with the kids coming behind them mm -hmm. because they're going to be the ones. Part of your background uh, beyond uh uh, working in the Secretary of State's office, you have a media background also, yes. and you're you're very aware of the state of media uh, in our community and 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 in the Greater Baton Rouge area. Uh, nationally, uh, 
media tends to skew in one direction or another. If, if, if you tend to be more liberal or progressive, you watch MSNBC. If you tend to be more conservative, you watch Fox. Uh, people think of CNN as, as the middle ground. I don't necessarily see it that way, but that's how some people see it. In local media, uh, there seems to be a heavy preponderance of, uh, of right-leaning media. Uh, talk radio is certainly right-leaning. Uh, uh, the, the news outlets that we have here uh, tend to be more conservative and right-leaning. What kind of impact do you think media has on our motivation and aspiration to vote and to participate in the political process. It's tremendous. I mean, people depend. I mean, a lot of people, just like what you just said, a lot of people, this is where they go for their information. Mm -hmm. They go to uh, my feel-good favorite television station or radio station or even newspaper rag because that's where, I, that's where I get my information. Uh, and social media, oh, wow, you know that's where a lot of the information comes from. Mm -hmm. it, it has an effect, but, you know, we as citizens, we have to do our due diligence. We have to do our homework. We have to find out about these things. We just can't get just this one side of the story. You're supposed to get the other side of the story, too. And when I was in journalism, and a lot of other journalists would say, you always have two sides, sometimes three sides to a story. Mm -hmm. And you as a journalist, that's what you're trying to do. You're, tr pres you're trying to present the factual information on whatever the topic may be, so that you or I or anyone else can draw their own conclusions about what has happened. Mm -hmm. And but it's it's a big draw. It it really has a very very heavy influence on on people's thinking and and the way they 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 really uh, the way they conduct themselves. I think to a certain degree. Did media change with? Uh commercialization um, talking primarily about television media uh, uh, at some point the news stopped being an information service and started being an opportunity to make money uh, and and with that opportunity to make money uh, people took certain views that they thought would be more appealing to uh, certain audiences in order to generate more revenue I would say, yeah. I, I mean, that's what it's always been about. I mean, I think they were. Everybody was trying to get it to the point where it was making money. Um, I mean, when what I'm, I grew up with Walter Cronkite on one channel <laughs> and and Huntley and Brinkley Brinkley on, on, the other, on the other channel, yeah. and it didn't seem to be about making money. You had the five thirty news. They came on. They reported the news, and they went off. There was no CNN. There was no twenty four hour cable news channel where you, where you were trying to find new programming all the time. It just seems that that as commercialization took over news broadcasts, these hard uh, bents in one direction or another took hold of, of news and has completely reshaped the landscape of American politics. And it continues to do that. And I think it's going to continue to be that way. We, at this point in time, are looking for, quote unquote, those opinions that we think that that favor our opinion, what we think. And people are going to gravitate to those television stations or those news media outlets or whatever the case may be because I have that same opinion or they expressing what I would like to say or want to hear. And that's where it comes in. And with that, they leave one station and now you're talking about now you got viewership. Now you're talking about audience. So now I can charge more for a commercial. I can charge more for this or that. Right. And that's where I think that's that's where it's at right now. I, I really do. I think it's like that. A lot of times, uh, you might channel surf, especially when you're watching news. You might mm -hmm. go from this and this to this to this, and whatever picks up 
a lot of times if that picks you up, you know, hits your fancy, then okay, I'm gonna stick with that. Right. But sometimes you just go, I'm, I don't want to watch that, or I got my own opinion about that, and I'm not watching that station. I'm yeah. gonna watch this station. Yeah. Yeah. With uh, 2020 coming uh, in the next couple of months and the census that's coming down uh, from that, uh, a lot of people don't realize the importance of the census when it comes to the drawing of congressional districts, state legislative districts, when it comes to the distribution of tax dollars uh, into various pockets of the community based upon who lives in those communities. Those decisions are made by the people who are in office, uh, who, who we elect in office this time around. The, 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 the state legislature uh, is threatening to be a supermajority Republican in both the state House and the state Senate. I believe it is a supermajority in the state Senate, and it's threatening with the runoffs to be a supermajority in the state House. Under those circumstances, from your perspective, uh, does it matter who the governor is? Uh, if 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 you have a if you if you have a supermajority in both the Senate and the House, does it matter if there's a Democratic governor in, in, in office? Wow. Uh, you know, you like to think that you would have someone in there that would be able to have uh, the wherewithal to be able to communicate with both Democrats and Republicans so that the right thing can be done. But when you're talking about forming districts and things like that, it's going to go straight down party line. I mean, you see that. You even see it in Washington. It's always down party lines. Um, I remember when I used to work uh, years ago covering the legislature, uh, the Democrats and Republicans or independents or what, whatever you want to call, it, it wasn't really like that. Uh, you'd have uh, a Democrat and a Republican uh, after things would over, uh, was over with, they'd go have lunch mm -hmm. or they would go out at night together or they would attend different things together and they got to know their families and their families would have interaction. Uh, it's not like that now. It's 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 all strictly almost party line, mm -hmm. uh, and in Washington it's even more so. Mm -hmm. You can't uh, you can't associate with a Democrat or you can't associate with a pub Republican or something like that. And I think that that's one of the things that's that's really hurting us. It's hurting our country. It's hurting our nation bad. African Americans uh, of of a certain age look at. Uh, younger generations of us, and I guess I'm starting to be in that age group that's looking back. Uh, uh, I'm old. Uh, and and, and you, you, you mentioned earlier that, that, that uh, people of, of, of the younger generation don't seem to be as motivated uh, as their parents and their grandparents were. We of, of a certain generation. I, I'm still old enough uh, to remember uh, America's apartheid. I remember separate uh, waiting rooms so do I. Uh, at the doctor's office. I remember not being able to try on clothes in the store so because we were Negroes. I remember being turned away from certain services because we were colored. Uh, so I look back at, at, at my children's generation and, and the ones that are coming up behind them, and I'm frustrated. At, at the fact that they they don't know and they don't seem to want to know, uh, but I don't think that that's something uh, that that can be rectified just in institutions. I think that conversations need to be held in the home that are not being held about the importance of what it is that 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 that, that you're doing. Yes, sir. Can I, can I show you something? Sure. See this thing right here? Yes, sir. You could be you could be in the same room with your kid and you could be trying to talk to them or you could see a group of kids in the same room you know what they're not talking they're not conversing you know what they're doing this and they're texting each other yeah that makes no sense to me why can't i just talk to you right across the table yeah 
That, I think, technology is good, but I think that it is really not allowing us to sit down at the dinner table like we used to and have a conversation. Everything is on a fast pace, Mm -hmm. you know. in, in some households, the mother and the father are doing two jobs and the kids are there, so they got to, you know, fix their own food or whatever the case may be or whatever. And, and they just don't have that, that family time like they used to. Uh, every, something is always pulling them apart going to do something else mm-hmm. rather than spend time with the family. And those stories that we know how things were and how it happened, they don't think that's important because they have not been taught. They have not, they, they don't study it. It hadn't been studied. It hadn't been passed down from this generation to this generation. Or even a class hasn't been given to, to continually to let you know, well, it wasn't always like this. Like in this year, in this era, in this era, this is what happened. This didn't just happen overnight. Right. Where you are just didn't happen overnight. Before then, we were property. Yes. We were property. We were owned by someone else. Yes. We didn't just get here. I'll give you an example. I was just reading something, um, I guess, on the uh, Internet about the, um, the soldiers that were killed over in Houston, uh, uh, a massacre literally. Uh, At one point, I think it was in the 1920s or something like that. Anyway, they brought these troops in, predominantly black troops in, to actually um, to be kind of help maintain law and order in this in this in this town in in Houston. But things happened. One thing got out of hand and at least 83 of those uh, it must have been like a hundred and something. Eighty-three of them were lynched because of just what we're talking about. But nobody—that's a story that I hadn't heard, but I read it. Right. And when I saw it, I said, "I didn't know that." Yeah. There are a number of things like that out there where those type of stories have not been told, so that our younger generation can really realize where we've come from. But you would think, and. There have been enough things that have happened in in recent years that should have dispelled the myth that our ugly past is just that. It's our ugly past. Uh, uh, 2016, in my mind, was a signal year to remind African-American folk that, uh, uh, you know, when push comes to shove, Mm -hmm. we're still thought of. As, if not as property, certainly as exploitable. Uh, uh, with, 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 with the shooting of Alton Sterling uh, that took place uh, in July, and then with the floods and, and the disparities in how uh, uh, people responded in the floods in 2016, uh, and minority families that did not seem to get the same kind of response from private sector and from government uh, that other parts of the community got. People are still trying to find ways to recover from the loss of their homes mm-hmm. and, of, uh, and of their property. You would think that that, that, that that would be enough of a lesson for succeeding generations, for, for the generations behind us, that, well, m- maybe, maybe we can't all sing Kumbaya just yet. M- m- maybe some things have to happen before we can sing Kumbaya. We, as a people, we have to learn how to get along. We really do. It's only one world. This is only one planet. We, you know, I, as far as we're concerned, it's where we live. You got to learn how to live together. And you got to figure out a way to do that so that everybody is treated equally. And you also have to make it a point that when you see, as I said before, if you see an injustice, you have to speak up. You have to say something. You have to say something. It's incumbent on you, me, or anyone else. If it's wrong and you know it's wrong, you have to say something. Because if you don't say something, then it figures all right. And it's going to continue to happen. 
It's definitely going to continue. And like I said, you're coming back to the voting process again. Mm-hmm. That's why you vote for those that you know will speak for you in those situations where it's need, where they needed to speak for you. You have to have people there for that. That's why you elect them, because you know they're not going to be afraid to stand up for the right thing and do the right thing. If I were to ask you, would you prefer, uh, at, at this stage in your life, would you prefer to be liked or to be respected? What would your answer be? If you had to choose, I, you know, some people say, I want both. But if you had to choose being liked or being respected, which, which would you prefer? I figure if I'm being respected, that means that I'm being liked anyway because they know uh, that what I stand for or in, in what I say and they respect what I stand for and what I say will bring about that like that you're talking about. But you know, I, you're right, at this point in my life, the only person that I'm really, really trying to please is my Lord and Savior. That's who I'm trying to please. If I do that, I'm good. I, all that other stuff, I don't, I don't care what nobody else says about me. I don't care what they think about me. As long as I'm doing and trying to do what he has told me I need to do, I'm all right. And I feel good about that. I just think that part of the problem with uh, certain segments of our community is that we want to be liked. And we don't necessarily want to be respected. Uh, uh, even in, in in the things that we post on social media, we're looking for a certain number of, of likes. likes. Uh, and, 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 and if we get the requisite number of likes, somehow or other, it feeds our ego, our esteem, uh, and it makes us believe that everything is okay. Uh, but I think that I agree with you. Like me or not, I I prefer it if you like me, but I demand that you respect me. And I'm gonna do. And, and you know what? You you have to earn respect. That's why if you say something or do something, you got to stand by it, especially if it's the right thing to mm-hmm. do. You have to do that. And as long as I'm doing what is right, not only out here but in the sight of God and I know you're supposed to take a stand you're supposed to say speak for those who can't speak for themselves you're supposed to say something if you see something is wrong and you know it's wrong you're supposed to do that and I expect people to look at me and say well you know the one thing I don't care about him but you know what I respect him for taking the stand that he took on whatever it may be Mm -hmm. and he stuck by it and that's what I'll do let me shift gears. Uh, it seems that the Supreme Court of the United States is uh, trying to rewrite uh, or, or, or restate uh, what, it, what freedom of speech actually means. Recent decisions that have come down from the Supreme Court seem to be attempts to shift what free speech actually entails and and how uh, Americans have the opportunity to express themselves. This conservative bent on the Supreme Court uh, uh, seems to be an effort to take away uh, much of the gains that were made in the previous presidential administration. <clears throat> what do you think happens if if Uh, Donald Trump gets a second term in office. You know, we've been talking about this little thing called voting. Yes. Didn't vote. Four years ago, almost four years ago, didn't get out and vote, did we? That's correct. People did not get out and vote. That's correct. Guess what? If you don't get out and vote this time coming around, you can expect that to happen. You can expect it to go more in a conservative way so to speak and you can expect a lot more of those gains that took place 
prior to 45 getting into office to be erased. You, you can expect it. So, therefore, if you don't get out and vote and exercise your right, you're going to get another or more conservative judges on the bench. And, you know, I, I mentioned the Supreme Court, but the president appoints federal judges on all levels, mm -hmm. not just on the Supreme Court. As I said. <laughs> which means that, that decisions that might not even make it to the Supreme Court That's right. are being negatively impacted by this president being in office. Absolutely. And if you don't get if you don't, if you don't vote, if you vote for the president, so you got the president you want in office. But guess what? That was all you did. You didn't vote for the senator, correct? Or you didn't vote for the representative or the U.S. congressman or U.S. Senate. You didn't vote for them. You decided to stay at home. So what you got now? You got something other or someone other than somebody that thinks like you or thinks along the same line in office, which is going to be an obstruction. It's not going to help the person that you put in office. So your voting makes a difference. It counts. You have to exercise your right. And if you don't, the judges from the appointed judges down in the districts all the way up to the Supreme Court is going to be dictating and taking away a lot of your rights that you know that you have already. I understand that upwards, and I know I'm going from one topic to another, but uh, I'm just trying to cover as much as I can with regard to uh, political events right. and how they're going to be affected in the next several years. Right. Uh, with this uh, uh, census and, and the reapportionment of congressional seats and what have you, I understand that some 70% of Louisiana's uh, population lives along I, the I-10, I-12 corridor, New okay. Orleans, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, Lake Charles, uh, and, and the heavy preponderance of African Americans who reside in this state reside in that 10, 12 hmm. corridor, uh, which makes it difficult to uh, draw lines that will allow for a second uh, minority congressional district, which is what some people are hopeful uh, that that we can gain out of this census. What's your view on, on the prospects of a second minority congressional district coming out of uh, this census? I, I just don't see it. I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't. Um, once you do that, uh, don't forget, you got to have those in, in office that are actually going to draw the districts. And you know what that means. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to, who's in there already are the uh, majority uh, house or whatever. Right. They're going to draw it for them. Right. You know, they're going to draw it so that it favors them. And I just don't see with what's going on. And with you having this many Democrats and this many Republicans and Republicans doing this, I just don't see that district being drawn so that it becomes another second minority district. I, I just don't see it. I don't see it happening, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, I was talking to a guy a long time ago when he first started doing districts. He said, you know what? Sure, you got to draw districts in, in minorities. He said, but you know, before it got to that point, they used to draw districts, try to draw them like they should be. Right. Maybe on this end, you only had 20% black and the rest were white. Or you only had 40% black and 60 They said you had that kind of in some areas. Mm -hmm. In some areas, you may have only had 10% black and 90% but what happened was they said that at that time a lot of the people who represented that little 10 percent or you know this is my district but it's only 10 percent they paid attention mm -hmm. the 10 percent was able to come and talk mm -hmm. they had a conversation they were mm -hmm. able to talk to that representative they were able to talk to that 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 uh congressman or they had to talk to them mm -hmm. and that 
to a certain degree, allowed them to get some things, not everything, but some things. Right. I guess what I'm saying is, what happened if you just draw it, drew it like it should be? Does that mean that no more blacks would be elected to uh, the, the, our representatives and senators? We wouldn't have black representatives and black mm -hmm. senators. Mm -hmm. What would happen with that? Mm -hmm. Would you have less whites? I, I mean, I'm just saying, if, if I was just throwing it out there to see what would happen if it was just drawn the right way. What would happen? Well, the fear is that uh, the, the the racial polarization that exists oh, in this gosh. climate is is so strong that uh, uh, the voices of black and brown people would be muted uh, and 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 disregarded uh, under those circumstances. However, I, I I I push back to the idea that you have to have seventy or 80% African-American districts in order to win. If you need 80% black district in order to win a seat, then maybe you don't need to be in the seat. And maybe if, if, if we were able to shift 20% of that 80% over into a majority white district, then the representative of that district, if, if you don't listen to a per, to to ten percent, you have to listen to twenty to twenty five percent. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you you have to pay attention to what's being said, and and it seems like our strategy is wrong headed when it comes to this. Uh, everybody wants to hold on to their own oh, yes. uh, supermajority uh, 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 for fear that they might not be able to prevail uh, without that, uh, but. You're winning your seat, but you're not doing anything for the benefit of the rest of the state under those circumstances. Well, you know, we we went from that, and then they ended up doing what was called gerrymandering. Yes. And that was to make sure that you were able to get uh, black folks in office. Yes. So that they can, they can that we can have a, a, a voice. I think that there's still going to be, I think we're going to go back to some gerrymandering with this I, I really do after mm -hmm. this uh, census is taken mm -hmm. and don't get me wrong I think it's needed so that there can be a voice but it's just a shame that we can't put 20% like you say or 25% over here 25% and making that that way they may not get even though they got 80% 80% may not always vote for that particular person again that's correct if you put the right person in so Maybe, maybe, maybe it might need to be looked at, maybe readdressed to see if you can't do something different. Yeah. The fear uh, of of some people with regard to a Responi governorship uh, is that, uh, among other things, he will attack HBCUs, uh, Southern University, Grambling State University, the, that the Southern University system, uh, the only uh, historically black college university system in the nation, uh, would, would ultimately be dismantled uh, as a result of a Responi governorship. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Well, um, I think he might try. Uh, if that's the case, if, if they're saying that, if he did try that, I think that he would have, uh, he would have really have a serious fight on his hand. I don't think that with the with the, the people who are in office now would allow that to take place. I think that he would get such a pushback that that would be something that he would definitely just back out of. I, I don't think he'd be able to do it. I really don't. Um, these historically black institutions that we have here, no. It, 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 I think if you did that, I think that that would be literally the fight of his life or anyone's life if they want to do something like mm -hmm. that because mm -hmm. these institutions have done a lot, not only for the state of Louisiana, but for this nation, mm -hmm. and I know that. What final thoughts do you have uh, uh, as, as this is being aired on uh, the eve of the election? Uh, uh, what, what, what words of counsel, wisdom, <laughs> advice would you give to those who are listening uh, to us now as they prepare to go to the polls tomorrow? I would say 
If you're going to the polls to vote, take someone with you. Because you know somebody that's already said what we've already said, my vote is not going to count. You pick them up. You tell them, come on, we're going to the polls to vote. Not telling them who to vote for, but go to the polls and exercise your right to vote. The turnout is the most important thing that will decide this election. And if you don't get out and vote, do not expect me to listen to you on Sunday morning. <laughs> You're upset because of the outcome. Yeah. If you didn't get out, don't talk to me. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. There's no sense in ha having any more conversations about, man, did you see? No, no. You had an opportunity to exercise your right to vote. Right. And you know for a fact voting came with a price, just like we came with a price for our Lord and Savior. Yes, sir. Exercise your right. Do what you have to do. Yes, sir. And be about your business. Yes, sir. That's me. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Thank you for taking the time to share with us. And uh, thank you for uh, the work that you continue to do in our community. Thank you for viewing. Thank you for listening. We'll be back again next time.